All right, welcome Dr. Maya Kinzigler of Monarch Family Chiropractic. And tonight we are talking about boosting uh, your immune system or supporting a healthy immune system. And certainly as we enter into the cold and flu season, uh, I think it's a pertinent conversation. And <clears throat> really, before we even go there, I want to just shed some light or, or just have a different lens in terms of um, cold and flu season and our immunity. Number one, our immune system is strong. It is resilient. It is healthy. Uh, we were born and programmed to be healthy and responsive and adaptable to whatever we're exposed to. If you look at the number of viruses, bacteria, you know, that we come into contact with on a daily basis, it numbers in like the millions, trillions. We are always exposed to stuff. And we don't even know it because our immune system is handling it no problem. It's just if our immune system is under significant amounts of stress, if it is, um, you know, suppressed because it's already handling multiple components that is toxic to the body, whether that's a physical, mental, emotional stress, or, you know, a chemical stress, uh, electromagnetic field stress, uh, that is when we start to discuss how you can start boosting your immune system because it needs help. Um, but most of the time, just so you understand your immune system to be healthy. Um, and to bring clarity to, uh, the cold and flu season, there's not like bugs out there that say, oh, it's, it's getting cold out. It's time for me to come out and do my thing, right? We are exposed to the same kinds of bugs, no matter what time frame it is. And so we have to look at what are the activities that we are doing uh, when it starts to get cold out. Are we getting as much sun exposure because the days are shorter? Um, are we staying in? Are we eating more, uh, you know, comfort foods? Uh, typically, starting in Halloween all the way through New Year's, we are eating uh, more sweets and sugars. It's more acceptable to eat those things, uh, and actually, you know. I don't want to say pushed, but it's encouraged to eat those things. Electromagnetic fields. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and so our activities and our habits and our routines change around this time period, making us more susceptible to stresses, to breakdown. Uh, and we go into that in understanding your immune system uh, you know, we have other workshops for that, but today we really want to talk about, okay, what are the things you can do to boost your immune system? And I want to start here uh, <clears throat> with the germ theory. The germ theory basically states that if you are exposed to a germ, you get, you know, X, Y, Z. But the question is, is if multiple people are exposed to it, why do those multiple people all have different reactions because you have experiences where somebody has the common cold in a work environment and not everybody has or gets the cold, right? You have experiences where um, households where one person got COVID and the rest didn't. And so we have to look at, it's not the germ theory. It's not the germ causes the disease. It's actually what we call the terrain theory, which is what is the terrain? What is the health of the body? Uh, that leads a body susceptible or more resilient in that exposure, that the body can handle it no problem or the body is breaking down and under stress. So um, <clears throat> I think germs has a negative connotation uh, and the word we like to use is microbes. You've heard of microbiome, it's kind of a trendy uh, word I would say in understanding microbiome health and how it's connected to immune health. Uh, but the human body is made up of 95% microbes, three to four pounds of microbes. That's bacteria, viruses, fungi, even parasites that are in our digestive tracts, which help us digest food and regulate our immune system and produce neurotransmitters and make us smarter, more focused and happier. Okay. Um, even micro M-I-C-R-O biome, B-I-O-M-E. Children exposed to bleach cleaners are 20% likelier to have infections like chronic coughs and flu. I love it. Um, 
than children who are not. So we have to get away from the idea that the germ or the microbe is the problem. We have to really look at what is the health of the person. And that's where I love, if anybody's ever heard of the conjoined twins, Dasha and Masha, they're a Russian conjoined twins. And really what's terrible, if you look into their life, they were um, subjected to terrible experimentation. Uh, but from that experimentation, we gathered some really interesting information on how our body works. And with Dasha and Masha, they had a, uh, they shared a circulatory system, a digestive system, excretory, uh, lymphatic, endocrine, and skeletal systems, okay? The only thing that was unique, uh, and they shared, they the didn't share, it was very separate, was their brain, spinal cord, and column. And so what was interesting about these conjoined twins is that Dasha and Masha had very different health experiences where one had a tendency to get sick often, uh, one smoked. <laughs> I mean, they just had very different health outcomes. Uh, Dasha was short-sighted and she was prone to colds, so she got sick more frequently. And as chiropractors, we're really assessing why is if somebody share, if two people share all these things, except for the brain and the spinal cord and the spinal column, um, you know, what is the difference if one has health stuff and one doesn't, right? Masha was healthier. She smoked, she had higher blood pressure. She had good eyesight. And so really when we're looking at uh, the difference between the two is what is the health of their brain and nervous system and how does that impact uh, the connection between the brain and the immune system? Okay. Um, yeah, I found this interesting. Flu, colds and other childhood diseases were experienced separately including the measles. So while one got the measles, one didn't. They shared the same body. It's fascinating. Um, so fascinating experimentation when you look at what we've gathered from these two, but really terrible if you decide to look into it about Dasha and Masha. So <clears throat> when we're looking at the immune system, we're looking at, okay, what is the brain and nervous system's uh, role here? How are they connected? Because there's an intricate connection with how the brain and the immune system function. And we always like to go back to the safety pin cycle. Okay, I'm gonna get my safety pin. Grab it. Sorry, guys. So, safety pin here. Ugh. Everyone's seen a safety pin, right? We love this because it's in a very simplistic way describing chiropractic. So here's the brain and here is the body. And the, way, the way the brain talks to the body is through this efferent and afferent loop of your nervous system. And majority of your nervous system is afferent, meaning sensory input. Okay, all the sensory input coming in. Smaller portion is afferent, efferent, which is motor function. But you've got information going into the brain brain is responding and motor information out. So we're looking for how's that connection. And if there's a disconnect, we call it subluxation, then guess what? There's confusion, there's chaos, there's slowing down of that interpretation of data. Okay, so we're looking at if the brain and immune system are inter intricately connected and there's something going on to impact the brain's communication there, it's going to impact how the immune system responds. It's gonna impact that resiliency, right? And so that's where I want to start because everyone who's on here is receiving chiropractic care. And I want to share some research around when you're getting adjusted, when you're getting chiropractic care, because of that brain, that nervous system and immune system connection, um, we see changes with how the immune system functions. So um, <clears throat> this came out in 2000, so it's old, but it was a comprehensive review of the literature revealing that there is a brain and immune system connection, uh, which makes sense, but they talk to each other, right? They talk to each other, which is essential for uh, maintaining homeostasis. So essential for maintaining a, and regulating body temperature, blood sugar, blood pressure, all of those things. Um, so there's a connection there. But let's go into some more here. So in a large study uh, of 3,000 individuals undergoing chiropractic care, these individuals reported on average an overall improvement ranging from 7 to 28% in physical symptoms that included flexibility, physical pain, fatigue, incidences of colds and flus, 
And then we have headaches, menstrual discomfort, GI disorders, allergies, dizziness, and falls. So, and when we broke it down to look at, okay, what was the significance of reduction of flus and colds? It was an average of 15% just by getting adjusted, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's continue. So chiropractic and flu. Uh, one of the reasons, this is fascinating. One of the reasons that chiropractic became a licensed profession across the US was because of how people responded during the 1918 flu epidemic. Here's a picture of a gymnasium that was converted into a hospital uh, during the flu epidemic to, to take care of everybody who experienced and was dealing with the flu. <clears throat> Homeostasis, H-O-M-E-O-S-T-A-S-I-S. So researchers out of Davenport, Iowa, which is the birthplace of, I guess it's the very first uh, chiropractic college. It's where it's called Palmer, Iowa, or Palmer Chiropractic College in Davenport, Iowa. <clears throat> and they found that in that city, they had 93, just under 94,000 patients were treated by doctors and there were 6,000 deaths. So they found that of the people um, <clears throat> going to medical doctors, one in 15 died, okay? Uh, <clears throat> of the data that was collected at the Palmer School of Chiropractic, uh, they found that there were 1,635 cases uh, with only one death, okay? So when we're looking at the comparisons, um, Outside of Davenport in Iowa, uh, we looked at, okay, there was 4,700 cases and only six deaths. So there was less death for those who were going to chiropractors compared to medical doctors. <clears throat> now, yes, it's a smaller number. Uh, and some people argue that, well, if <clears throat> you're going to a medical doctor, there's potential that they are sicker. Um, and that's where I love this that came out of Oklahoma is uh, <clears throat> Oklahoma kept data and found that there were 3,500 people under chiropractic care, only seven deaths. Furthermore, there were 233 cases given up as lost after medical treatment. That means that these people were told to go home and get your affairs in order. Medicine has nothing more to do for you. Prepare to die. Prepare your families. 233 cases of these people, they went to chiropractors and all but 25 of them were saved. So, could be, could be, could be. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, this is back in 1918. So there's not a lot of medicines here. So I bring this up because the brain body connection is so vital. These people had no hope, no more treatment. And what does chiropractic do? We're not looking at giving you anything. We're not looking at an outside in approach. We're look, looking at how can we support the healing from within? How can we support a brain and body better connected so that it becomes more resilient to respond and adapt, right? Um, which is really a beautiful thing. We have everything we need within us. Um, and there are time frames where we need more than that. But the vast majority of us just need better connection. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I hear people who get sick on a frequent and regular basis who start getting chiropractic care and they say, well, I don't get sick as often. You know, you look at studies of medical doctors and their children and chiropractic docs and their children, and what are the outcomes in terms of how much medical care do the chiropractic kiddos need versus the medical docs? Because they're getting adjusted, the outcomes are very different. And there's actually um, some studies there, but I didn't include it in here. So uh, here's another study, chiropractic and immunity. So looking at uh, the effects of immunoglobulins, B lymphocytes, which are white blood cells, and pulmonary function or lung function, in addition to some other immune processes. <clears throat> and they found that when an adjustment 
took place to the mid back. They found an increased white blood cell count after 15 minutes of the adjustment. Um, let's see, let me make sure I'm reading this right. White blood cells taken from blood collected 15 minutes after the adjustment was significantly higher than the blood collected 15 minutes before and 30 and 45 minutes after the chiropractic adjustment. So within 15 minutes of an adjustment, we see a boost in white blood cell count, which is pretty cool. Pre-COVID times, we used to tell people, you're sick, we want you to come in and get adjusted. Again, it's not that we're not focused on the germ theory, we're focused on the terrain theory. What's the health of the person? And we know people who get adjusted are healthier. Um, and so we wanna support you uh, recovering and healing from your cold, your flu, whatever it may be. <clears throat> so it demonstrated this enhanced respiratory burst following chiropractic adjustments. And this burst is needed to help our immune system and our immune cells to destroy any invading viruses and bacteria, right? Here's some more. So here's another study um, of HIV positive patients and they were getting adjusted in their upper neck. And over a six month period, they found that the group who did not receive chiropractic care experienced almost an 8% decrease in CD4 cell count. And CD4 cell, again, is just an immune cell, um, you know, in terms of how they're measuring immune activity. Meanwhile, the group that received chiropractic adjustments experienced almost a 50% increase in the cell count over the same period. That's pretty substantial. 50% increase in immune function just by getting adjusted, right? It's a big deal. Certainly a big deal if you're dealing with a lifetime, you know, HIV diagnosis, right? Okay, so that's where my data ends in terms of the chiropractic component. And I'm sharing this first because I want you all to realize we get really excited about what are the nutritional supplementational stuff I can do to help boost immune function? What are those things I can do? Tell me, give me a list, check it off. And those things are there and they're vital, but you just by getting adjusted are supporting a healthy body and immune system, period. It's not anything that is added. It is from the inside out supporting a healthy system. So know that you being consistent with your care and you doing this over long periods of time will build a more resilient system. Okay. So that's my goal to really get across to you is you're already doing some great things. Now, this is a big one. I took this slide from boosting immune function during COVID times, which is on our, our channel. Um, but they found that your risk of dying of COVID if you were 60 years and older increased by ninefold just by being 60. Now we can't do anything about our age, okay? But what we can do is we can support healthy vitamin D levels because this is what they found about vitamin D deficiency. Your risk is 15 times or greater of dying of COVID if you have vitamin D deficiency, period. We can do something about that. That's how important sun is. That's why when the flu and cold season comes around and we're getting less sun, the days are shorter. That's why it's a big deal. And so ideally we wanna get you know, 15, 20 minutes of ideal sun between 10 and 2 p.m. Um, of sun exposure. And there's some docs, uh, one specifically named Dr. Ryan Cole, who really is, is um, <clears throat> I mean, he shared, he, I think he's out of uh, Idaho. He shared that, you know, if you're above this certain latitude line, which Colorado is, I don't remember what it is, um, that you could be running outside all day long, completely naked, and you're still not getting the sun that you need. So that's where supplementation during these cold months are important. Um, <clears throat> so it activates more than 2000 genes that include the vitamin K dependent proteins and repair genes. It helps produce antibacterial, antiviral peptides. It's powerful against breast and prostate cancer. Uh, it's useful for treating deadly respiratory viruses, pneumonia, bronchitis, flu. 
Um, and it's estimated that over 40% of the US population is deficient. Here's the risk factors. If you're elderly, if you live north of Georgia and people who have darker skin color, guess what? We live in a region where we are at risk for being vitamin D deficient. Uh, if you have a darker skin color, you are, that's the second check against you. And if you're older than, you know, 60, 65, then, well, I, I guess I wouldn't say elderly is 65. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would say elderly is probably more like 75, 80. Um, vitamin D can, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so vitamin D could, yeah. I will talk to you more. Okay. Does that sound good? Um, one thing I will say is if you've had your vitamin D levels tested, you want to know what that number is because conventional um, like medicine will say that, you know, a 30, I don't know what the units are. I think it's NG over milliliters. I'm not sure what NG is, but 30 uh, is, is the lowest limit of normal. So they'll say if you're at a 30 or a 32 or a 35, oh, you're, you're good. But if you talk to the vitamin D experts, they say you want your range between 50 and 80. You know, so um, I would say you're getting more to ideal ranges when you're around 40. <clears throat> and I mean, you look at the vitamin D experts, they say, okay, if you're 40% of us are likely deficient, if you look at that cutoff level being around 40, that means 90% of us are actually deficient in the US. Okay. Um, how are we doing here? Okay. Now, vitamin D is important. Uh, you get it through sunshine. You get it through... Um, vitamin D actually is a hormone in our body. Um, it acts as a hormone too. Um, but you need it from supplementation. Your body doesn't create it on its own. Uh, so that's where you get it through sunshine, foods like sardines, salmon, liver, egg yolks, cheese, grass-fed butter, and supplementation. Um, it's recommended that every six months you get your blood levels tested, especially if you're doing more therapeutic dosing to get your um, vitamin D levels up. You want to really understand where you are and what you can do consistently. Um, if you've never taken vitamin D before, um, it's the good rule of thumb is to do 10,000 IUs every day excuse me, every day for two weeks and then move to a thousand IUs per 25 pounds. So if you weigh a hundred pounds, that means you're doing 4,000 IUs consistently. But again, you can really target your dosing if you do those vitamin D level checks every six months, especially in the summer months, you may not need that level of intensity of dosing. Now, magnesium is also uh, a vital um, supplement to help support your overall immune health because by magnesium is required for your body to convert the vitamin D to its active form within the body. So that's where magnesium is considered uh, more of an essential in terms of immune health uh, so that that vitamin D is absorbed. Now, <clears throat> majority of people do have some magnesium deficiency. It's in charge of like six to 700 enzyme activities in the body. Uh, if you have and a good way to really gauge if you're magne magnesium deficient is if you feel stiff and rigid, um, if you feel tension and tone. A magnesium deficiency shows up in your muscular system as a lot of tone, tension, that sort of thing. Contraction of your musculature. <clears throat> and so um, an easy way to just start introducing magnesium is Epsom salt baths. Soaking in hot water, two cups of Epsom salt, soak for 20 minutes. Your body directly absorbs that. But oftentimes we need a little bit higher dosing. So that's where you can do, you know, you know, get it through your nutrition, get it through magnesium dosing. And you're going to gauge that through your bowel movements because magnesium, depending on the type, and there's actually multiple types of magnesium, something like 11. <clears throat> um, magnesium can really soften your stools. And so if you start taking magnesium, you need to build up to that level and really gauge, okay, what is going on with my bowel movements? And if it really softens things up, you need to reduce that magnesium dosing. 
Um, so typically I tell people start around 200 milligrams a day, then go up by 50 or 100. And if you have capsules that are, I don't know, 150, maybe is starting with halving that and going up daily uh, or going up, you know, after three, four, five days of that supplementation, go up by 50 or 100, do that for four or five days and go up and really gauge that. Um, low magnesium levels are linked to high blood pressure and diabetes. So important nutrition. Um, zinc is also a powerful immune booster, especially if taken early. I'm just going to jump down to right here. Uh, taking zinc lozenges, lozenges at the first onset of cold symptoms has been shown to cut the duration of the common cold by six to seven days, if taken correctly. So you've got to take every two hours within 24 hours of symptom onset. And you take 18 milligrams of dose, and then you work to, so total dosing is over 75 milligrams which is pretty high dose of zinc. Again, this is if you are sick. This is not a maintenance thing that you would do, right? Vitamin D, I'm talking about maintenance and really gauging your levels. Magnesium, I'm talking about maintenance too. Zinc, not a maintenance component. This is not something you do regularly, okay? And <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is COVID heavy. I forgot that it was, but <clears throat> there was a study that uh, created this COVID cocktail of micronutrients, and they found that with this specific cocktail, that it actually um, blocked the uh, receptors that the spike protein would attach to, to allow for COVID to do its thing. And so included in that cocktail was quercetin. Now, quercetin is... Um, works in tandem with vitamin C and helps the body uptake vitamin C. Uh, cruciferous vegetables. So that's your broccoli and Brussels sprouts. And I mean, it's, it's really the green leafy nutrient dense veggies, turmeric, green tea ex extract and resveratrol. That was a part of their cocktail. And this is interesting. So if you look at this figure here, so this control is they weren't given anything and um, this blocking was, they totally blocked the receptors and they looked at, okay, dosing of this micronutrient um, cocktail that they put together, the higher dosing, the more it blocked. Okay, so if you had lower, more diluted samples of this micronutrient dose for cocktail versus high dosing. So again, I'm sharing this with you because if you just clean up the foods you're eating, that is supportive of immune health, right? Um, you know, you look, you can look at what is in or what contains quercetin there, cruciferous. It's just really amping up that dosing, making it very concentrated. So, and this is the last thing I'll go over because I'm getting close to my time here. Um, <clears throat> social iso isolation is said to be the worst. Imagine, imagine the worst stress you could ever experience as a human being. I don't know, for, for me, I go to maybe abuse, maybe family abuse. I think that could be maybe the worst thing I could experience, generational. The research that's coming out is, show, is saying that if you are isolated, if you don't have community, if you don't have healthy social connections, that is far worse than any stress that you could ever imagine. So again, this is COVID heavy, so I apologize, um, but we've, we're coming out of it. Some people are still coming out of it, but we've been so scared to be around other people. We are a um, species that is meant to be together, meant to be connected in all previous, you know, major, I guess, you know, lifetime stresses that are happening on, you know, a national level and a global level. We've all looked to each other to get through it. And in these last couple of years, we've been told, no, no, 
don't be together, right? Um, you need to stay isolated and it's for the greater good. Um, and I guess I'm sharing with you that the research shows that if we are lonely, if we are disconnected, if we are isolated, that has major detri detrimental impacts on our immunity and our health. Uh, and so while in the front end, says, okay, I'm lessening my potential for exposure, on the back end, you're let, making yourself much less, less, less resilient to handle anything. Does that make sense? Uh, <clears throat> so lonely, loneliness can really cause this long-term fight or flight stress signaling within the body that negatively impacts our immune system. If we are in constant fight or flight, we go back to the brain. If our brain thinks we are in survival mode, it will suppress everything that is not pertinent to surviving. Okay, that is digestion. That is conception. That is immune health. I mean, that is, that is hormonal and endocrine health because we need to be ready and alert to go to fight, right? Um, and so if we are lonely and disconnected and isolated, that lends towards that experience. So uh, just by being together can be wonderful for your health and your immune system. So, uh, so that's where I'll end. I know I went over, uh, but my hope today was really to first uh, support, yeah, support you making healthy choices and you being here for chiropractic care in and of itself is building good, vitalistic resilience and health within your body. And number two, especially as we're going and moving into this next season, um, of how can you be more consistent with your choices on what you're feeding your body? Not just nutritionally, but in terms of your connection. And you need to find people who are going to be supportive in your choice, whether you choose to, again, I'm not saying, you know, abstain from everything, but if 80% of the time we're choosing to feed our body good nutrient dense foods, the other 20% is not going to be, be a big deal. So go by that 80% rule. Um, but you really want to make sure you're surrounded by a community that supports your health choices, right? Um, so I appreciate you for being with us tonight. And I share this. I know it was chiropractic heavy. Uh, I share that because number one, I want to support the care you're receiving here and your understanding of how it's impacting you, not just structural and spinal health, uh, so much more than that, but who do you know that doesn't know what you know? Um, and that's my ask of you is if you can share this with somebody, because we're always looking at the long-term gain. You come in and we look at, okay, what's going on here and now, but what's the end game for this person? What's 20, 30 years from now? And if you're on a trajectory where if you just tweak and shift it, get on a, a different trajectory, it can change your life experience, right? And we want that for everybody. So anyway, <clears throat> so appreciate that you're here. Uh, we'll see you next week. If you have questions, please bring them in. Uh, and 